Hello, and thank you so much for joining us today for the webinar, Some Tips and Tricks in Composite Resins. It is a great pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Carlos Fernandez Villares, whose aim during this presentation will be to discuss a work procedure which guarantees aesthetic and good restorative results. Dr. Fernandez Villares earned his degree in dentistry at Complutense University of Madrid and has postgraduated in aesthetic dentistry. He is a collaborator professor in the Master of Aesthetic Dentistry in Madrid, UCM, since 2004. He is also a collaborator professor in the Continuous Education Program, Anterior Composite Resins module and Clinical Cases module in the Complutense University of Madrid since 2006. He is a member of the Spanish Society of Dental Prothesis, an author of several articles in the area of aesthetic and restorative dentistry. He lectures internationally and in Spain in aesthetic and restorative dentistry. Dr. Fernandez Villares has a private practice that focuses on aesthetic and restorative dentistry in Azero and Villares Dentistas in Madrid, Spain. We'd like to thank Dr. Fernandez Villares for being with us today and DT Study Club for making this lecture possible. Please take note of any questions and comments you have during the lecture, as they will be addressed by Dr. Fernandez Villares at the end of the presentation. Without any further delay, please help me welcome the expert himself, Dr. Carlos Fernandez Villares. Uh, hello, welcome everybody. I, I know you're there. I don't see you, but I know you're there. Uh, my name is Carlos Fernandez Villares. I'm from Spain, from Madrid. And I want to share these minutes uh, with you talking about the composite dressings. Um, I named this lecture Some Tips and Tricks in, in Composite Dressings because I think that the uh, composite resins are the things that we use more in our daily practice and is a material that we need to control uh, to uh, get more difficult uh, treatments in, in dentistry and of course is the most uh, uh, done treatment uh, every day in our practice. Uh, when we talk about the composite resins and uh, today I need to uh, thank uh, GC Company uh, for, for the invitation to this webinar. Uh, it's so important, uh, the first thing, that is we need to see. Uh, and I always like to start uh, with a sentence that I read on the book of uh, IDACA, that is uh, Solutions for Dental Aesthetics, that it says that uh, what we see with our eyes is not... Uh, uh, all there is to see, that we need repeated experience to uh, reveal the whole. Um, that means that uh, when we see our restoration that we made 10 years ago, at that time we say, oh, this is totally perfect, this is beautiful. And then we see 10 years later and they say, hey, who the hell made this? And the answer is us. So the most important thing is to know what we are doing and to see what we are doing and uh, train our eyes to see and uh, to uh, be more critical with our restorations. Uh, the other sentence I like to mention is one from the book of Liars uh, from my friends Anna Salat and Jordi Manauta from the group Stade Italiano that I'm uh, a member. That it's, uh, it is mandatory to understand the color of any composite resin prior to use it even if only involves to open the different strings and compare the color. That means you need to know the material you're using uh, prior to use it in the mouth. So uh, let's talk about how to select uh, a composite resin and how we choose uh, a composite resin. Uh, if we read literature and uh, we know exactly the materials we're using, it's very important to know that there are several types of materials and they have their own indication. We don't need to say, okay, micro-hybrids are not uh, used for this, or nano-hybrids, or, or nano-fillers, or whatever. We need to know where to use every material. And there are some properties that are going to tell you that are very important in our practice to know uh, exactly if a material is okay or not 
to uh, use it in, in our restoration. Uh, first property is the uh, handling of the material. Uh, for us, um, it's so important, the handling of the material, because we're going to use it every day and uh, we need to make our life easier, our restoration every day easier. And what means handling of the material? Uh, it means that the composite don't stick to the spatula. Uh, in, we're going to make some tricks uh, to avoid that the composite stick to the spatula that uh, com sometimes converts into something horrible for us. The second thing is that uh, we need to have enough working time. That means we need to work with the light of the equipment, the, uh, not to work in the darkness. Sorry, but if we work in the darkness, we don't see what we are doing. And the third thing is that uh, we need a material that allows us to reproduce the dental anatomy. And to reproduce it and not make that uh, it is modified after. Uh, that means if you build up a mamelon, you need that mamelon to stay in that form that you made with your spatula. And the best thing is to make it with a material that don't stick to the spatula and with light. Uh, we can say the, the companies, okay, let's change the composition of the material because I want uh, to improve the handling. And there are some things that we can make for uh, improve the handling of the materials. Um, one is that uh, we normally use some gases in the, in the spatula with um, a spray of alcohol. And what we do is to continue maintain our spatulas dry. And uh, with the spatula dry, we uh, avoid that the spatula stick to the composite or the composite stick to the spatula. That is something that uh, can make your uh, treatment very horrible. Uh, there are other people that uh, what they do, they say that they don't want some uh, rest of uh, small hairs of the gas in the, in the spatula and they, what they do is to put the spatula into a glass of uh, alcohol and then they dry it in the air to have a very uh, dry material. But sometimes for me it's not so good to have a glass of uh, alcohol there working next to the patient. The other thing that we do when we uh, use our material is to preheat the uh, composite resins. Uh, for this, there are uh, several literature that says that if you preheat the material, you will have uh, more advantages than if you don't do it. Um, for example, you can reduce viscosity, you can improve the flowability of the material and decrease the film thickness. Um, in, the, in the other hand, the people that say, okay, don't preheat the material, is that they say that you can increase the polymerization shrinkage. But the fact is that most of these articles are made in the um, in, in vitro studies. So um, if we follow the literature and in our practice, we've been using preheating materials for several years and we had very good results. And there is an article of uh, one of the master in aesthetic and restorative dentistry that is uh, Pascal Magne and uh, written with uh, Roberto Carlos Spreafico that they say that when you use a micro hybrid or a nano hybrid restorative material it is recommended to preheat the material to facilitate the placement and minimize the risk of interlayer gaps. Uh, so if Pascal uses, uh, let's use it because uh, uh, is, uh, is a reference in, in restorative dentistry. So one of the properties that we want to have in our material is a good handling. The second property is uh, the policing, is a, a good policing. That means in our practice, easy policing, few steps, not so much a step to have a good shine, that we need a few steps and if we can only have one step, it will be better. Um, the other thing is that long-term maintenance of this uh, policy uh, on our material. For sure, uh, the golden standard in, in, in this uh, uh, material are the micro, uh, uh, micro filler. 
but they are not strong enough, so we need to have a balance between microfilament and the new materials. About the seeds, we need to obtain a seed that is similar to the uh, natural color of the teeth, and uh, we need at least different opacities, and what we normally do is to compare different uh, cells, in this, case, in, in this type of uh, 0 0.5 cells of enamel made with uh, the my seed guide, the uh, uh, seed guide of a uh, uh, style italiano group. This is, um, the, uh, in this case, this is a, the inside, the color a opaque inside, the A2. This is the translucent, the standard, and the junior enamel. You see the different opacities between them that they allow you to pass more light or uh, less light uh, there in the diamond of uh, Superman. We need to understand what material are we using and we have uh, in, the, in the genial uh, anterior uh, composite we have different type of name colors, that is, for example, the standard, the outside and the inside. In the standard colors, we have the A, B, C, this is more for uh, dentin and for cervical uh, restoration, and for sure, every, every material now have the bleaching uh, composite resins. Then, a very easy way to reproduce the enamel, that is to use a junior enamel, adult enamel and senior enamel. Young patients, middle-aged patients, I'm not going to say what is middle-aged, and senior patients, because everybody wants a junior enamel. And inside colors to disguise the fracture line, only in the A side, in the, in the A side, because uh, we want only to disguise the fracture line, and some effect colors like the translucent, the incisal, and the cervical enamel. It's very important to know what is every uh, letter, because we need to know what material we are using. For posterior, the, the system is very simplified, and we have the P, that is a posterior, A1, A2, to A4, and the junior enamel, if you want some uh, different effects and translucency, we can even use some incisional enamel. But the most important thing is the anatomy in posterior. Because if we have a good anatomy, we can use maybe only one color and we can obtain very good uh, restorations without doing so much. So we have the material, the composite, we have some rules or tricks uh, to choose it and le then let's make how to use it without problems. Uh, addition works, but it needs to be in a special way, so it's very important to use the rubber dam. Um, there are several types of rubber dams. The most important thing is try to use it the best way and for posterior, for anterior, uh, there are several ways to do it. Um, the most important thing is that to use a material that works good in your hands. Try different type of rubber dams and have some techniques. Let's give you some rules that we use in our practice. This is the one that we use more and uh, to make your life easier. Let's, let's give you some, some advices about this, about the rubber dam. First of all, don't go to the big holes, go to the small ones and start from the third one in the uh, normal uh, holes and use this for the molars, this for the premolars and this for canines and incisors. And it's very small ones, so we're going to need an additional lubricant for the uh, rubber dam. For example, we use oxalite gel that is something that uh, goes very well with water and we don't use Vaseline now because if you, you, if you use Vaseline the problem is that then it's very difficult, it's very hard to eliminate the, the Vaseline when you put the, the rubber dam but you need to make the rubber dam flexible 
is to not break uh, the holes. If we want to simplify our uh, system, uh, we can say that this is the, the universal clamp. We can use this uh, in the molars for posterior restoration and even for anterior because we can isolate everything, but in interiors we can use um, some special clamps uh, to retract the gingiva and to have everything under control, but uh, this is one of the most universal clamps that we can use. Uh, we put it first and then we go with the rubber dam, very flexible with the lubricant and we don't have any problem. If we use other type of, uh, uh, of clamps, what we do is to put it, goes there step by step using the flows and put it under the gingiva and floss it with a knot uh, to have everything under control in a dry field. We have the composite we have the addition and now we need to uh, uh, know what materials we are using. Uh, we need a good product but okay every uh, there are a lot of good products but let's uh, let's make some question uh, let's try to answer this question to know how to do it in, in addition. One, uh, let's try this uh, part from the clinical point of view that means I'm not a researcher, I'm a person that works in the clinic every day with patients and I want that my restoration works for a long time for my patients. So the questions that uh, I'm gonna put here are which type of adhesives are available in the market and what problems they have. The second thing is that what can we do clinically to improve our addition? The third thing it's a very typical question of the patient. How many times can we guarantee a, uh, an adhesive restoration? And the last one is which one should we buy or should we use? To answer the first question, now the classification is being simplified. And now uh, there is no, we don't talk more about generations and we talk about etch and rice adhesive or auto etching system. In the etch and rice adhesive, we can divide it in three steps or two steps. Three steps is the etching phase, the primer, and the bonding in a separate way. The hydrophobic and the hydrophilic. Then, manufacturers decide to simplify the system and to change the two bottles into one bottle, and they mix the hydrophobic and the hydrophilic part, and they put a simplified system. Then some markets decided that they don't want to etch and they make an auto etching system in two steps at the beginning. And now they have materials that give you everything in one bottle. That means the auto etching systems. What problems do we have, do we have in, with uh, normal clinical steps that we do every day? So if we etch the enamel and then we add the dentin. The problem is that uh, we activate what we call the some enzymes that we have in the in the dentin, and the problem is that the MMP are then uh, degrade the collagen fibers. Then what we what what is the clinical relevance of this? That in five years or four years, the problem is that we have some spaces between our restoration. And the, and, the, and the teeth because there are some uh, spaces and the hybrid layer is not the same as at the, at the beginning. That, uh, this is a, a study of Armstrong that demonstrates that with uh, uh, electronic uh, microscope. Other problems are about the application of the material and the solvent, the elimination of the solvent. So let's see the literature to uh, know what, what we need to do about this. Um, this is an in vitro study that demonstrates that the best thing is to apply four or more coats of the simplified systems. That means the etching and then the primer and the bonding in the same bottle. So what means to apply four coats? means you apply one, you wait, you blow the air to eliminate the solvent, apply another one, 
blow, apply another one, blow, and then you make the polymerization only one time. We don't want thick uh, uh, enamel lay uh, adhesive layer. Sorry, what we want it's to uh, complete the spaces that we are eliminating with the air, with the syringe of the air. And there are other articles that say, okay, we apply several coats, but how we do it? And this is a very good article that says that they make a clinical trial and they compare mm, different restorations made with a slight mode, vigorous mode, and no rubbing action. And at the end of the study, 24 months later, they realized that the uh, restoration that works better are the ones that were applying with the vigorous mode. About the solvent evaporation, we know that incomplete solvent evaporation leads you to permeability and decreases the bone strength. That means you need to eliminate the solvent. But the other thing is that complete evaporation of the solvent is impossible. So you don't need to follow exact rules of the manufacturer. You need to eliminate more prolongated time the solvent that the manufacturer says. That means eliminate more time and then you are not only eliminating the solvent, you are eliminating the solvent and part of the adhesive. That's why you apply different coats of the adhesive and you will have better results. Another thing about the uh, auto etching system, the all include uh, all in one, is that they don't have enough uh, strength, bone strength in enamel, for example, and they are like permeable to fluid movements only because of the polymerization lamp and the polymerization light. So sometimes we need to make something more to improve the addition of this type of adhesives. What can we do clinically, as clinicians, to improve the, our vision? So, the first thing, not etch the dentin always. If you don't etch the dentin, you will not have the problem of the MMPs. So then you will have uh, more success if you use an outer etching system. You always etch the enamel, until now, but don't always etch the dentin. Always eliminate completely the orthophosphoric acid. It's very important because there are some orthophosphoric acids in the market that uh, stays there in our restoration, in the teeth, so it's very important to eliminate it. So, well, use chlorexidine, 2% chlorexidine during one minute after the etching phase to inhibit the activity of, the, of that MMPs. Apply several coats of adhesive and in a vigorous mode. Eliminate the solvent as much as possible. Remember, you eliminate the solvent, you apply another one. You eliminate the solvent, apply another one. Then, if you use a simplified system, use an additional layer of hydrophobic resin to improve your uh, addition. And use anesthesia always you can. That means that uh, if you use anesthesia, you reduce the content of water in the dentinal tubules in 70%. So, less water, more easy to the adhesive to penetrate in the tubules and better hybrid layer, that is what you need. And the typical question that makes the patient immediately when we finish our restoration, hey, this is going to last forever. So, let's say, how can we uh, guarantee an adhesive restoration. There are ones that goes very well and this is something I made in 2005, a very easy restoration, it's nothing special and you see it nine years later, this is 2014 because we have a very good protocol, easy restoration, no problem. But uh, what we can answer our patients, we say okay we know that in the literature says that after five years we can have some degradation of our interface between the material that we're using and your teeth. And what we're doing now is to put all we know or our knowledge 
to make this to improve. And we are using the last techniques to make this long for example, more than five or seven years in your mouth. And now what we realize uh, is that if we use the other teeth in a proper way, we have very good success. The problem is normally dentists don't use uh, the products in the proper way. And which one should we buy or should we use? Um, it's always about the money. Uh, everywhere and uh, if we follow literature we need to say that we can we need to recommend to use edge and rice adhesive in three steps and self edge adhesive in two steps but uh, uh, the reality is that normally people don't buy this type of adhesives even the key opinion leaders recommend it but the f fact is that Use, if you use any adhesive of, of the market, use it in a proper way. For example, if you use an auto etching system in posterior that is very good for the denting, use the auto etching etch prior the enamel and you will have very good results. Apply different coats, eliminate the, uh, the solvent so well and you will have very good success. Another controversial point about composite resins is the liners. We use it or we don't use it. Uh, when we talk about liners, we only talk about two. That is flow oval composite and glass ionomer uh, restorative material. Um, now, uh, the glass ionomer are increasing the use because now we're doing more prevention than uh, being more destructive. And, uh, we're being uh, eliminating so much teeth in the past and now we know that uh, if we don't eliminate we will have uh, better results and uh, about the flowable composite resin what we need is something that is a good material to put in place and uh, don't have so much bubbles and um, you have a good result we put only a very small layer of flow uh, composite resin and if we follow literature uh, people from classic articles they say that recommends the use of flow composites and yanomers as uh, cavity liners um, the article I mentioned before they use that recommends the use of glass yanomer barrier to cover the access to the canals in endodontically to the teeth uh, Japanese, uh, they say that the, the use of an ultra thin layer of flowable composite uh, to reduce the interface uh, micro leakage and the incidence of voice in the restorative interface. And some uh, actual books uh, from like uh, Ronaldo Irata in, in tips, they say that uh, use flowable composite resin in posterior. Uh, to uh, increase the marginal adaptation of our restorations. About the uh, anterior composite, that is what we're going to talk now. Uh, the most important thing is that we want a material that disappears in our mouth. We don't want everybody to say, hey, you have a restoration there, and it's this brand. It's, no, we need something that uh, uh, is... Uh, more uh, disappear in the mouth of our patients. This is how it was prior. Um, what we do always is a protocol that we're gonna uh, mention during the webinar. We put the dentine, some efforts, the enamel, translucent. It's very important to follow the rules, to apply the acid edge, the adhesive, know what material you're using, apply, control the thickness. It's very, very important to control the thickness. Now we have tools to that allow us to control the thickness easier. And of course, to reproduce the dental anatomy after the finishing and polishing. And try to imitate as much as possible a restoration that integrates in the mouth. But the most important thing is not uh, to see the uh, patient at this moment. You need to see it in the, during the years. And this is uh, the same restoration five years later. 
and when we see it in uh, close up we realize that we have some problems here it was an hybrid restoration so the best thing is that there is composite resin and we know now that we have better materials so we eliminate the last layer we change it and we control the thickness of enamel and we can have a very easy result in in few minutes we use composite resins in different situations but always with the same protocol it's knowing the material have a step by step that is easy is repeatable for everybody not only for some people when we have more aggressive uh, uh, breaks we restore with different techniques but uh, always enamel denting easy no problem the most important thing is the anatomy and what want the patients now the patients want please don't touch my enamel so this is a, a case that we solve with a genial anterior and uh, in this case what we do is not to touch the enamel of the patient and we solve with the genial anterior we only add the composite resin obtaining the same opalescence no same effect that integrates in the in the mouth of the patient then we check the color with a um, polarized filter that uh, give us uh, the real color of the um, of the restoration and of the teeth and we have very natural results without touching the enamel the patient stays exactly the same that he was first and then uh, she's very happy very small tips in aesthetic dentistry that very easy cases that we need to know the material we're using because if we try to eliminate this without that uh, the restoration is seen is viewed by the patient uh, is so important more difficult cases because this is 14 year old girl and we need to make something only with composite resin this is how we finish always different views and then always the review this is four years later it is integrated in the mouth it's not the same as it was at the prior but the most important thing is that now she's 18 years old and stays with the vital teeth and she don't have any problems so we need to know exactly the materials and we need to control every part of the treatment that means from the beginning the preparation from the addition the stratification process and the finishing and policing procedures it's very important to have everything under control to have a protocol to get to the goal that is the uh, predictability and to reproduce this every day so let's talk about interiors and now we have the material uh, we need some tools that allow, allow us to make uh, uh, good restorations this is uh, LM Arte uh, from the Style Italiano group we need to add two more things to the properties that we asked for the composite resins if we're talking about anterior this in posterior is not so important that is the fluorescence and this is a photography of my friend Fernando Rey uh, this is a non fluorescent composite here and this is what happens when we go into the dark night and here is a fluorescent composite and if we have a patient that for example go to the disco or in some ambience uh, in some places that they, they have uh, the, uh, this type of uh, lights it's very important to give them a restoration that um, don't go saying hey you have a restoration or a dark restoration or an excessive 
uh, flawless and restoration. And this is very well explained in this article by my friend Fernando Rey and Joanna Sousa that they, they explain and how to evaluate the fluorescence of different materials. And the other thing that we need to add to the properties that we were talking, that were the handling, the policing, the different shades, and the fluorescence is the other one that is the opalescence. We need to imitate this effect of a natural tooth because we have now materials that allow us to obtain this type of efforts. And the patient has these efforts in, the, in their teeth, so we need to do it. And for the step by step, for the uh, protocol, uh, what we do every day is to make static acid photography. We make the color, we have some tools to make the color easier, diagrams to reduce the clinical time that we're using in, in, uh, with the patient, the preparation, addition, stratification, finishing and policing, and as I told you before, the reviews. If you review the case, you're training your eyes and you are revealing the whole, that is the sentence that I say in the, uh, in the first slides. When we do our cast, it's very important to have a good cast, uh, stone cast models, and when you can reproduce, you can study the, the case and you can reduce the time you are with the patient. Clinical photography now becomes something so easy because uh, we have uh, tools that are digital cameras that allows you to make a very easy photography in a few seconds and you can see the result totally immediately. So it's very easy and normally I put photograph of small children. So if I can make a photograph of a kid that means that it's uh, uh, so easy to, uh, to make the photograph. Uh, I'm not a photographer, I'm only a person that can document the cases. So to obtain this type of photography is very easy. I normally use this type of flash for the anterior photography and the rim flash for the posterior one. Uh, what we need to see with the photography, with our eyes, etc. Well, we need to see the different colors that we have in the, uh, in the teeth and uh, different parts. Uh, we need to reproduce this same opaque enamel that allows you to see the dentin, but not so translucent like here in this part, in the scissor part. Uh, the mamelons, the translucent part, the opalescent aloe, we need to know that prior to uh, try to imitate it in the, in the nature. And the most important thing is to work in a working team because uh, if you work alone and you try to do everything alone, you're not uh, seeing everything. You need to uh, need the help of our assistant, other doctors that allows you to uh, see uh, the color better than you see it. Some tools that we have, we have uh, now devices for uh, the cameras that allows you to make polarized uh, photographs very easier that eliminates some information of the namen and only can make you to see the exact denta, dentin anatomy um, makes you easier to reproduce it after. And this device is uh, developed by Dr. Bathos. This is called Polarize and you can obtain a static uh, image. And now we can make the same thing with uh, uh, a device that is called Smile Light by Smile Line of the group Style Italiano. And even we can combine new technologies like uh, smartphones or whatever. This is software that is going to be improved in the future and we are going to have a, uh, better results there. And I'm going to show you uh, example, this is a photograph made with a Canon 30D and with a twin flax. And this is the same case made with the Smile Light and with the iPhone 5. Uh, sometimes this is a very good photography to communicate uh, with a uh, normal, it's not only for documentation in a congress or, or for a, a course. This is the final result where we add the composite 
only two colors with the philosophy of style italiano, denting and control of the thickness of enamel. Um, this is genial anterior. And then if we want to record the video uh, to check the color and to, um, to test the final result, it's very easy. This is something you can send by SMS or uh, WhatsApp or email to your company, to your friends, to your technician, uh, very easy. Other thing we like to use in our protocol is to make a diagram of the colors we're going to use prior to use it in the mouth. So here we don't like to think if we are going to use uh, junior enamel in the palatal, okay, let's, let's put more here in this mammal or no. We write it first and then we do it in the, in the mouth. And other thing, if you are treating a small kid, you don't need a lot of time, you don't have a lot of time to reproduce the, uh, the dental anatomy. So what you need to do is to write it in a paper, make a draw, and then you can reproduce it very fast. So if you want to make these three lines or this type of uh, developmental groups, important. Draw it prior and then it will be easier. Then we make the wax up. The wax up allows you to try the product in the patient prior to do it and to control exact quantity of material that you need to add to different teeth. In this case, we don't want to make any preparation and what we do is to add this exact quantity to the canine, this to the lateral, and the same in the other side, but in the lateral we don't need only a few material here in the distal part, but we control it with the silicon matrix. Kids, always the same. We need to control exact material quantity, then we make the wax up. It's very important to know how to make this type of wax up because uh, if we do it every day, we will. It's a very good training to make it after with a composite resin. These are different views, and then to make the silicon matrix. I always is very important to have a proper manicure uh, because if the photograph uh, is going to be uh, done, uh, we don't want. Uh, uh, we want everything to be under control. We cut it with a scalpel and check it in the model and always taking care following Newton Fall rules about the buccal incisal line angle to have very good results and predictable results in an easy way and very fast. About the preparation. Uh, what type of preparation do you want for your mouth? Do you want uh, if uh, you have an accident and you have a problem in your teeth? Uh, so I like to mention uh, Professor Baratieri that uh, he says in his book that ideally the need for any kind of preparation should be completely eliminated, especially with children and adolescents. Uh, it's very important to try to not to make a big bevel or a big chamfer to reconstruct uh, uh, a teeth and to make a, a restoration. Sometimes we have some problems because it's very difficult if we have uh, uh, not enough space to disguise the fracture line. Um, sometimes we can have some visual problems, but uh, if we try to uh, see the whole uh, teeth, we realize that this is not a big problem and the best thing is that the uh, patient gains a lot because he, we don't eliminate his enamel. About addition, nothing more to say that we say before, uh, but normally in anterior what we do is the total edge technique and with uh, edge and rice adhesive and if we use two steps or three steps, uh, Normally, literature says that it's more important to use three steps, but uh, I always say if you use two steps, do it in a proper way, and you will have uh, very good results. And normally, market and people, uh, consumers, are uh, buying the two steps, so the most important thing is know how to use your material. 
So you should do it in a good way and you will not have problems. This happens to everybody that works. That you are working, you don't put the rubber dam there and you make uh, you are working near the gum and this is start bleeding. No problem. So some tricks that you can put the core uh, the most important thing is after you need to etch the preparation just to clean it the surface and use some uh, resin that allows you to complete your restoration without any problem and um, to finish the restoration that uh, have a proper result uh, during the long time. About the finishing and polishing procedures following Newton Fall technique we divide the teeth in three parts the first one is the primary anatomy, that is the basic form of the teeth. We do it with aluminum oxide disc. Uh, the second one is the secondary anatomy, that uh, we do it with these developmental grooves. We do it with uh, one uh, five uh, hand piece and with uh, diamond bars and with uh, uh, thirsten carbide uh, bars. And then this, that is the tertiary anatomy, that uh, exactly that uh, the same that we have in in, in the money. And um, the most important thing is to know how to reproduce this with the one five uh, piece and a very uh, slow uh, speed. Now let's summarize this everything that we saw in clinical cases. These are made uh, with a uh, genial anterior. Um, they are going to show you two cases due to the time that we have. Uh, first case is an uh, orthodontic, uh, orthodontic uh, treatment case uh, that uh, we received this way. And we made two uh, provisional restorations. And then uh, when uh, the brackets are retired, what we do is... Uh, we propose the patient to make a whitening to improve the color of the of the teeth. But uh, after three weeks, the problem that we have is uh, that we obtain a very white teeth. And then in this case, we decided to choose a material like a genial anterior because some color that they have imitates very well the uh, whitening teeth. And here what we do is the protocol, models, wax up, silicone key. Then we do our diagram. We are going to use these colors that are the enamel, junior enamel, incisal enamel, translucent for the effects and the bleaching white like the dentin. We make the etching. We go teeth, uh, one teeth individually. We apply the adhesive layer, then the palatal, following what we draw in the picture and what we see during the diagnostic phase. We apply the different stratification masses of the material. Then we cover the restoration with a loxalate gel to improve the polymerization. In this case, we modify the emergence profile with a metal matrix. Then we use this type of uh, strips uh, to polish the interproximal part. This is the Epitex one. That the advantages that it has is that they don't eliminate too much uh, the anatomy of the teeth. That we make it with a very slow to have a very good. Uh, uh, shape, different grades. This is the immediate result. And the most important thing is to check the material, the check the cases after. This is prior to do the widening in the lower incisors. And this is the review when we do the widening there. And we have a very uh, natural uh, restoration that integrates in the mouth. 
And the other case is a, a very small kit but with a big fracture. Um, there is no other material that the composite resin to solve these type of cases. Uh, we make the diagnostic phase, as I told you, photographs, models, photographs with the polarized system, and we make a diagram, the palatal cell. We're going to use, in this case, the inside colors to disguise the fracture line. You're going to use the unit enamel for the palatal, and this is the AO2 color for disguise the fracture line. Then the mammals that we're going to use a standard color, A2, the translucent, that we're going to use a translucent enamel color. And finally, we're going to finish the restoration with a junior enamel. After making the uh, isolation with the rubber dam, what we do is to check our silicon matrix and go through the uh, addition process with the etching. Prior, what we do is to uh, seal the entrance of the uh, endodontic acids with a glass ionomer. Then we apply the junior enamel. Then the AO2, you see that we have the opacity that allows you to disguise the fracture line. Then the denting to reproduce the natural denting that we saw in the diagram prior. Then the translucent enamel here. And finally, the junior enamel to reproduce the enamel, controlling the thickness with spatulas like uh, the Misura instrument or different spatulas that we have here. And make the finishing and polishing procedure to have a proper anatomy. In this case, we add some white tints to try to imitate the effects that we have here in the adjacent teeth. This is uh, what we have. This is the final x-ray. Uh, this uh, case was made in collaboration with Dr. Eugenio Carlos Grano de Oro Cordero. This is one of the best endodontics in, in Madrid, in Spain. And then what we do is to check our restoration with the uh, polarized system, static photograph and dynamic uh, uh, polarized system with the smile light, and this is with the polarized. And always review the case just to, what I say at the beginning, check what you're doing and reveal the whole. And uh, I always uh, I like to thank everybody that is watching me. I hope you're watching me. I know you're there. And I always like to finish with uh, this sentence that is uh, from Chad Chaplin that says, the smile uh, though your heart is aching. And now let's go to the questions. I, uh, I'll try to answer everything that you ask me. Okay? Thank you so much. Uh, answering... Maria Madonna, a question about if I recommend the use of biodentin as a liner. Uh, I have to say that I am not a user of biodentin. Uh, still, I don't use it, but I am reading literature that I think is uh, uh, one of the future in restorative dentistry. And, uh, but still, I'm not uh, a user of uh, biodentin. And the second question that you make it if, if I etch after place the liner, if I place a flowable composite, uh, uh, I don't etch uh, after that. What I do is to etch uh, prior, but if I do it with a glass aromer, yes, I, I etch after, but uh, I don't etch the surface of the, of the glass aromer. More questions? it okay with the with the sound
uh, about uh, Omar, uh, he asked me uh, what do I think about the color composite from GC. Uh, well, uh, it's uh, a great material I only use uh, for posterior and uh, well, but uh, I still I prefer to use uh, uh, regular mm, composite uh, like uh, a genial or other other brands uh, to make the restoration. Uh, color is okay, but I prefer the management of other type of composites. Uh, I prefer genial management instead of color. Alan Brown asked me what kind of bonding system I prefer to use. I have to say, in posterior, I normally use uh, auto etching systems, but uh, always etch the enamel first because uh, they still don't have enough uh, bond strength in the in the enamel, but that's very good uh, to avoid to etch the the, the dentin with normal uh, etching systems. Um, in interior, I uh, prefer to use uh, two-step systems. Uh, with uh, I think I, I mean three-step systems is uh, etching and then the primer and the bonding separate. But uh, as I tell you during the lecture, the most important thing for me is to know the material I'm using and try to use it in the best way. So I don't care if I use a two-step system or three-step system. What I try to uh, follow the steps to uh, obtain the best from the, the RSC system that I that I use. But if I have to make a resume, I can, I say I would always use like a universal system, auto etching system in the posteriors, and in interiors I will use uh, uh, some etching and uh, primer and bonding in separate way. Well, um, they tell me that uh, when I see micro leakage of uh, and discoloration of the restoration, what is the, usually the cause? Uh, I think uh, in my practice, uh, normally if I see a micro leakage, uh, it can be uh, uh, I don't add uh, in a proper way the enamel, or maybe some occlusal problems. But uh, I will go more uh, to the uh, etching and adhesive states. Uh, uh, prior, I, will, uh, I don't uh, uh, invert so many time in my adhesive system and in my adhesive phase. But uh, now what I do is I spend enough time to make my adhesive phase uh, uh, the most uh, mm, in the best way. So I can obtain very good results and don't see that micro leakage. And about this coloration, it can be uh, the habits of the patient, and of course, if we use some hybrid uh, resins, uh, the problem is that they, uh, they maybe they are not uh, polished enough, and they are not in a in a good way. So I think it's uh, both things. Is uh, uh, first question is uh, I think it's a problem of uh, the conditioning, well, the addition, I think, uh, etching and addition phase, and the other thing is the uh, polishing of the material. Uh, Omar, I, uh, I, for posterior teeth, I use sectional metrics. I normally use Garrison system. I use uh, um, uh, the system from uh, Palo Dem Plus from the slide. But uh, in most cases, I use a garrison system. Uh, the most important is to use a sectional matrix and silicon uh, wedges. And the ring, it's very important, the ring, too. Uh, to use a proper ring to obtain a very good uh, contact area, contact point. Okay, uh, Christian Kalinov uh, asked me how often I examine and repolish uh, the restorations. Uh, 
Uh, normally, I make the recall of uh, my restorations every six months, uh, but if it's a patient that uh, has a high risk of uh, uh, caries uh, following the Campbell protocol, or uh, if they have uh, uh, not good enough IG and whatever, I try to see it every three months. But uh, normally, I repolish them every year if they need it. If it's a good restoration, believe me, I don't touch it. But normally, it's every six months I review my patient. Every year, I uh, repolish. But uh, if it's an hybrid composite that I use uh, uh, normal in, more in the past, uh, it's uh, more often. It's, uh, every uh, six months, I make the repolish of the, of the material. Uh, that means, say, how to save the tooth aesthetic. Uh, well, I don't understand very well the, the question uh, uh, about how to obtain a good aesthetic shape. I can tell you it's only a way to practice anatomy and study anatomy of the teeth. Watching natural teeth, I always try to imitate it using correct tools uh, like a spatula, grasses, but the most important thing is to know the anatomy, study the anatomy of the natural teeth, and then you can obtain very good results. Okay, uh, Maria Madonna asked me uh, if I use chlorexin in all restorations, all in the posterior ones. Well, n normally I use it in the posterior ones, but if I have uh, uh, an anterior restoration that has uh, more denting than enamel, for example, in uh, patients with erosions, in patients with uh, that they have uh, some problem of uh, acidic, uh, acidic problems with uh, they eliminate the enamel itself. In that cases, I use the chlorexidin after the etching phase. Uh, Nagrendan asked me, saw some cases of genial in class four. I saw you uh, during the presentation two uh, uh, class four cases. And, uh, I think we don't have more time, but uh, I will uh, I will be very happy to show you more cases. But uh, during the presentation, the last two cases are genial. There are class uh, four restorations. And uh, in the clinical part, I, I mentioned, there are genial cases. Well, uh, Marie asked me uh, what do I use for polishing, diamonds or flatted bars. Well, uh, for anterior, uh, normally I use uh, uh, disc, aluminum outside disc, uh, uh, and then I use uh, some uh, rubber, da, uh, rubber points and diamonds and flatted bars. Uh, always I start with the diamonds and then I finish with the flat bars. Uh, and after that I uh, finish and make the shine of the restoration with a disc and with some aluminum outside paste. Uh, Omar asked me, uh, do you have uh, any addition system for broken porcelain with composite? Well, um, uh, it's a, the, the problem every time that we have uh, broken porcelain is that we need to repair it and uh, the addition is not so much predictable. Sometimes we go to some courses in Congress and we see the, the photograph, but then when we go to the real clinic, we realize that this doesn't work so, so well. Uh, the thing that best uh, works in our hands is to uh, make uh, the um, um, fluoridic uh, acid uh, phase and etch the porcelain, uh, put uh, the, the silane and then put some uh, heat. And then what I do is uh, try to put a, a two step, uh, three steps, sorry, a system analysis that is etching the 
again the, the porcelain but only to clean it with uh, orthophosphoric acid and then to apply several coats of the primer and then the bonding and then uh, the material but always when I make a, when there is a, a broken porcelain and I try to uh, replace it because if not, there is always uh, uh, that little piece that is always broken. Dan, uh, Tran Dan asked me, uh, the color of resin we choose the same, like patients, so it's so difficult. So do you have any tips about this? Okay. Now as I show you in the presentation, I use uh, the lamp of style Italiano that it's uh, called El Smile Light. Then it's a, a polarized uh, light that allows me to eliminate uh, some part of uh, uh, the reflection of enamel and then allows me to get uh, a better uh, real color. Then uh, with the uh, recipes that we have for uh, the composite resins, what we do is, uh, if for example, we have an A2 color, a Vita shade guide, we put the uh, dentin and the and the exact uh, thickness of enamel. Uh, we put a 0 0.5 thickness, and then uh, we can obtain more predictable results. Uh, so now with the photographs and with the color and devices like uh, the lamps, uh, we can obtain mm, very good results. I uh, need to recommend you that if you want to make uh, a good safe color match. Uh, you do it immediately when the patient goes to your office and uh, we do it with the lamp and uh, to make two or three registrations, one by yourself and all with your assistants and people that work with you. Um, Omar, sorry, I don't understand your, your question. You put me, are you with teeth within or against? Uh, if you can write again the question, uh, uh, that means uh, if I am a person that I like to maintain the teeth, I, I have to say yes, of course, and I try to eliminate as less enamel as possible, uh, but if not, please can you read, uh, write again the question? Uh, Marisol King. I believe he means how do you best shade match your resin composite to your patient teeth? How do you choose the best shade of composite to use? Okay. Uh, how I match? Uh, what, I, what I do is I have individual shades made with the My Shade Guide tool uh, of the material I'm, I'm going to use. For example, if I'm going to use Genial. What I do is to I have my my own individual sales of genial, and then with the lamp, I uh, make the color match, and, and then I select the color. That means if I'm gonna make a combination of A2 and a standard and a junior enamel, I have my safe type uh, with the combination of a A2 standard and junior enamel, and then I use my safe guide, and then I I. I, I make that uh, uh, color selection. Ah, you, you say, 
uh, Omar, you, you asked me if I make the whitening of the teeth. Yes, of course. I, I make a lot of whitening in the teeth. Uh, and I think uh, we don't hurt the tooth, uh, but uh, we need to do it in a proper way, of course. I normally use uh, home bleaching. And I have very good results. Um, I have uh, 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 great results. Uh, believe me, every patient is very happy with their white teeth. Now I understand your question. Oscar Adriano, what's your preference for polishing restoration? Well, I, uh, I, I tell it before, uh, I use a soft flex system uh, for anterior, then I use uh, diamond bars uh, from Comet and um, flattened bars or uh, toxin carbide for, uh, bla, uh, bars. Uh, I I do it with uh, one five uh, hand piece, and then I use uh, some flexi bath or some uh, disc that allows me to make the shine with a special paste of aluminum oxide. So it's, it's not a problem. But the most important thing is go step by step. Um, um, uh, know exactly your material. If you use a, a microfiller, it's going to be less steps. If you use a hybrid dressing, you're going to have more steps. Uh, know your material, and it's better uh, to do it. Galina, uh, Dr. Villares, your smile is contagious. <laughs> you still smile more often. Thank you for your wonderful presentation. Thank you, thank you, <laughs> thank you, Galina. Nevena, uh, do you have any cases with sensitivity of the teeth after the sedation? How can we can we? Okay, um, Nevena asked me uh, if I have sensitivity in my teeth after the sedation. The question is not. That's uh, how can I obtain that? Uh, always making the other teeth steps very carefully and not to be in a hurry. If you etch the enamel, don't etch the dentin or in posterior, and then apply several coats of the primer or the universal system if you're using an outer etching system or whatever. And that will be uh, the way to avoid the problems in posterior. In anterior, normally I don't have it. Maybe in class five, but uh, in the past when I etch uh, all the dentin and enamel, but now actually. I don't etch the dentin, even in class five, I only etch the part of enamel, and then I apply several coats, and I do it in a, a proper way, and I don't have uh, problems. Alan, uh, you asked me, how did you make the matrix for the composite to repair incisal edge of the anterior teeth? Well, uh, the matrix, uh, in th I normally, if it's only a small incisal edge, I, I will not use the matrix. I will uh, do it uh, by hand. But normally, what I do is to make a wax up. Then I obtain a silicone matrix for that wax up, and then it's the way uh, to obtain uh, a predictable result. What I do is to uh, uh, put the matrix in the palatal, and then apply the first coat, uh, the first layer of the enamel, and then I put. Uh, uh, my my composite resin uh, it's uh, very easy but uh, I, I will do it if it's very small you don't you can't put uh, your uh, your silicon matrix and sometimes we do it uh, by hand Marisol, then you have a very deep proximal lesion, class two. Okay, uh, Marisol, you asked me uh, how I make the management of uh, subgingival restorations. Well, uh, normally, uh, if it's very subgingival, I try to do it in two steps. That means what I do first is to make the deep margin elevation. That is uh, the technique described by Pascal Magna and Roberto Spreafico in the article I mentioned during the lecture. And then what I do is an indirect restoration. Because sometimes the problem is that if we 
try to manage them the uh, the restoration subjectively. It's very difficult to uh, have a very good contact area, contact point that allow us to make a, a good function. So uh, if you don't want to make an indirect restoration, what we do in that situation is make it in two steps. First step, what we do is to make the deep margin elevation and then we change everything and put a, a sectional matrix system to make the uh, contact area. But I will do always in two steps. The best way is to make the second step in an indirect way with an only or, or an inlay. Uh, Canute. Uh, how can we talk about bleeding happens after flossing to the mess during cementation of veneers? Okay, if you don't want to have problems during cementation of veneers, uh, uh, please uh, use the rubber dam and uh, floss it uh, and put it with a knot. And uh, another good trick is to give the patient chlorexidine during one week uh, during the provisional phase. Then you will have less problems in the, during the cementation. But uh, what I try to do is to uh, uh, be the first. That means be faster than the blood. The blood is always there and we need to avoid it. My patients have exactly the same as all of you. And they have problems with the bleedings and they have gingivitis and we try to do our best in our practice. But sometimes we have that problem. So what we do with that is try to uh, treat every patient if, if we're going to have problems with bleeding. Then uh, use rubber dam, uh, thick rubber dam, and then uh, you will have no, no problem. And if not, you can have retraction cords with sun at retraction pace, and you will have very good success. Oh, thank you, Marisol. Thank you. <laughs> I hope all of you like it, so it's uh, my proposal. Thank you very much, Dr. Fernandez Villares, for sharing your lecture and your insightful information with us. We'd also like to thank DT Study Club for making this online course possible. And thank you, our wonderful audience, for your interest and participation. The C quiz is now available online on the course page, and completing it will allow you to earn your ADA SERP CE credits. The recording will be posted online within the next 48 hours. You will receive an email notification with a link to the recording. Further questions for Dr. Fernandez Villares may be submitted directly on the website, on the courses page, under the Ask the Expert tab. So please go ahead and submit your questions, and Dr. Fernandez Villares will be sure to get back to you as soon as possible. Please be sure to visit the DT Study Club educational platform, www.dtstudyclub.com, and keep an eye out for a growing schedule of online courses. Thank you again to all, take care, and goodbye.